All right. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. This is a low budget version. We're on tour. Uh, okay. This is episode 49 of Music Real Talk with Marvin. We have John Nadell joining us. Basis Hello. for Marvin. Thank you for having me. I'm, f- I'm so fucking fuzzy today. How how fuzzy are you? Completely. Why are we calling the Vicolum 49 of? From the, the Gold Rush in 49? I don't know. It's, uh, Is that a thing? Yeah. Was there a Gold Rush? There was 49? a... Yeah, like... The, 18, you, you guys have a different history class that you guys took in Israel, I suppose. 1749, 1649, 1449, 1249, 1049. 18. Oh, it must have been 18. Anyways. We, um, Is it, what team is it, 49 of... Philadelphia? San Francisco. That's 76 else. Yeah. Who knows? Yes. What are yeah, you talking 49 about? 49 else sound like San Francisco, maybe. Anyways, uh, we are currently in Studio C at the Sweetwater Studios recording this podcast all scrunched around a $100 blue microphone and a laptop. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, but we, we just finished uh, tracking our album. We had two days to do it. Very good album. Huh? The Zebra album. The Zebra album. AKA Dirty Horse. Dirty Horse. The Zebra are just, Zebras are just dirty horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John, what was your experience like? Um, well, I'm glad that we got to play the music every day for the last couple of weeks leading up to the session. Yeah. That yeah, helped. Yeah. I mean, that, that's usually our process, but. After a year of not playing very much, that was... Uh, we never did it just after a tour, though. Never. I kind of like time. it. It's really yeah, nice. actually, I, li- I I was more tired at the beginning, because partly because we had a lot of long drives and we drove all night to get to the studio. Yeah. On time. Yeah, we, we drove straight shot from uh, Worcester. So Worcester, Massachusetts, all the way to Fort Wayne, Indiana, right after our gig, so we left at 1 a.m., it really worked out amazingly because there was a hurricane coming, Hurricane, hurricane uh, Henry. H.H. was about to come all over the northeast. So, uh, and, and it allowed us to get all of our mic levels the day before the session, yeah, too, after which a was fi- huge. After, after a 14-hour drive, they let us into the studio a day early just to set up. That's, that's the one thing. That is the one thing we've never, ever done. Uh, well, most have a day don't, to just get your they sounds. Really charge you by the hour. Well, usually, if you get your sounds the same day you start tracking, you're so tired by the time you're starting. There's that, yeah. and there's also kind of you rush through it a little bit because you're anxious to start. You just don't know how right. yeah, it's going to go. Yeah, spending money doing it. So you're like, I'm spending a yeah. ton of money an hour. It's exactly that, but it's like it's so nice to really take the time. We found out a huge, uh, like the guitar tone would have just been terrible if we didn't take the time. What happened? What, so this is pretty nerdy, but. There's like a, what people call a wet dry rig where you send your wet sound uh, through one amp and your dry sound through the other. And the way it was hooked up, like my amp just wouldn't do it right. So I was getting all this weird distorted sound on my reverbs and delays. And we, again, cut, the point is because we took the time, we figured it out and came up with a solution. And everything sounded pretty. Yeah, we, with saxophone, we never tie stuff out and we did this time around just because we had a little bit extra time. Yeah, I tried all these microphone combinations. Because yeah, they all sounded fine. Yeah. Oh, I did notice... the ones that sound better. Ribbons, like, you know, less, really taking the time listening to what, like, typically we'd record with a ribbon. And, like, for Russian Dolls, when we did that album, it made so much sense because you're going for that, you know, darker sound, more classic, more jazz... Well, the question is if it, it gives it to um, the mid that the other one is missing. I kind of like if I have a small diaphragm condenser, so it's just a good move that nobody almost almost nobody does. Yeah. The young, young Albrecht does it. That's how we found out about it. Yeah. But I'm wondering if the saxophone is going to cut through like it should. But I'm guessing it will be fine. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. I asked Sean about it. We heard it. When we heard the saxophone on its own, it sounded... Good, so obviously, but it has to compete stuff with stuff we have to figure oh. out. But I think we did a good job. I mean, th- just the microphone selection here is so crazy. Yeah, everything compared, about it. Compared to, like, a normal studio. Yeah. yeah. And I had made the decision to do all the bass direct out my head so that after the session I could 
punch stuff in at home, but then it turns out we're getting a way better bass sound yeah. here than I get at home because well, the you're preamp running, he's using. Yeah, he's running you through a $4,000 tube preamp into like a $4,000 compressor. Yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, some of those toys mean something. It's okay. Yeah. It's the craziest thing. It's well, definitely the nicest place we've recorded. For sure. I'm excited because when we did sweet Shredding at Sweetwater, we were very limited in the sounds we were getting because it was for a video and the saxophone and drums had to be in the and same room. And you also had issues with... Uh, I had well, issues that, with yeah, that Yes, the saxophone was super limited because it was just packed with drums in it. Mm-hmm. And the guitar was low. We also have microphones. We want the same microphones. Yeah. And then the guitar, we had issues too. Yeah, big so. issues. Yeah, but I mean, also with this album that we're making, I think the thing that's going to be, you know, going back and punching in, like, you know, rhythm guitar tracks and second voices and this kind of thing. There's, there's definitely stuff we could add to it at home, mm-hmm. but I'm glad we got everything we really intended to it's down It's probably going to be mostly some actually guitars and home parts at this point. Yeah, but we even, got, even did percussion. Yeah, we, did, we got ever to play some percussion. Which, see, I'm glad we did it here because we had the nice percussion instruments and... It was easy to record them. Yeah, it took a second. Yeah. It took a second. Exactly that. Yeah. So that's all good. Um, I don't know what else. What else I'm, I'm just, we ate like this weed brownie that we bought in Maine and watched Mortal Kombat. It's and this uh, movie. Huh? It, it, did it, because John watched it sober. How did Mortal Kombat hit you? Was it the greatest movie you've ever seen? No, it wasn't. Oh, Didn't it wasn't leave? bad. It was, <laughs> it was sort of what I expected it to be, and I enjoyed it. It was good. Good over I wasn't, here. I wasn't, I wasn't having an, you know, out of body cinematic experience. <laughs> it was so intense for me. Yeah, that's, that's good. So funny. So funny. I highly recommend it. That mixed with uh, the the weed brownie, but yeah, we got it in a festival in Maine. A really nice festival. Um, what was it called? So Scopia is on the good Unicorn side. Unicorn Tea Party. Yeah. Unicorn Tea Party. And Scopia and the game is on the good guys' side too? No, I don't think so. I don't think they put that kind of judgment on the characters. Oh, really? Yeah. In the game there's no good side, bad side? I don't know that I know of. I mean, they're all kind of brutally murdering each other. Yeah, but wouldn't you have like a like a storyline to go with a game like cutscenes? I mean, they the they do. I think like they kind of build uh, more and more. They build the story up more and more as time goes by. You know, especially the people that need to turn it into a movie. It's just like, you know, two cartoon characters fighting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> need to come up with a plot. No, the plot was ridiculous. Everything about it was, the dialogue was ridiculous too. Everything about it was ridiculous. But yeah. So, some pretty intense, over the top acting. But yeah, yeah. Luke Kang guy. Well, it was the right thing after two very intense days in the studio. And yeah. With Bonnie, for sure. Did we talk in the with last Cookie. podcast about Harry Brown's farm or. I don't know. Okay. Well, Sounds well, familiar. When did we do the last one? I don't remember. But anyway, we, we played Unicorn Tea Party. Up in Maine, it was a great hippie festival with super different energy than the hippie festivals that we're used to. It was kind of more chilled out at night. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was another thing. When we went, if we only got there at night, I feel like we would think the hippie festival is very similar to our hippie festivals. The day, the energy was very very intense. Like the people that were there when it started. Yeah, it was like 90 degrees and not a lot of teeth. It was a lot of teeth. No, and really intense people. Yeah. it really felt like we were going to get story time, but the story never came. Yeah. It was false. I feel like we could have if we hung out all day. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Or, all night. Potentially. Like something, it looked like a place something would happen. Yeah. So, John, what was, like, oh, now, that, now that we did the uh, album, what, what the, like, do you want to get together when you get home? What did you learn that you need to do more of, less of? Um... Phrasing stuff for soloing. Quite specifically. Just like economy of ideas, how to take a motif and then, you know, bounce back and forth between things. Kind of like rhythmically or more? Yeah, like like do a a rhythmic trick, like a thumb one-two kind of 
think fast sextuplet thing mm -hmm. but then to go to take that into some sort of melodic phrase and then bring it back at a different place in the harmony and just stuff like that I want to get together this tour was so the first time I heard you play some subdivisions on grooves like uh, you, you started playing a lot of like on the funk thing it goes like boom getting to that yeah I've lights. been working on those techniques and you know they it's when you learn a new technique it at first it's like a it's like a party trick and you can only do it under specific circumstances it takes time to be able to incorporate extended techniques seamlessly into your playing so yeah. um i i think between the last album and this one there were a lot of new techniques that i got a lot of control over um but now I'm trying to work them in musically, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, I don't know, man. It's like I just felt like after in the way we recorded was we were doing a few takes of each one of our songs, like three takes as a whole band, and then like maybe we would just. We were go. very good about not doing extra solos this time, which we did last time. Yeah, we were very good at keeping it to five. Yeah, five five takes tops, which I mean for some of our songs it's like hours. Well, if you um, didn't if you didn't get it in in five takes, like your sixth take is not going to be. That's better. That's well, the true. way that, we that's play, experience. though, it's like it's true, but the way we play, there's always something. There's always some. I mean, the, my biggest fear uh, all the time, and the reason I like doing a lot of takes, is that when you're comping takes, a lot of times you you like there are, there's a part of your solo. Like measure two, a G minor, whatever. That's like all you have, you have like all the awesome shit in the world to choose from, and then there's like a chord, or like you know, in the middle, like the this place in the form that no none of the takes you did anything cool. Yeah. So it's like if you just improvise enough, you kind of just splatter your playing all across the form. Eventually. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. But then you get into this place where it's option overload too, because if you have. 12 takes to choose from what ends up happening is that you just start having like this negative feeling about like all the takes like eight and up or something like the end of your playlist you're just like more tired of it you don't you don't actually go there and look it's tough you know? a lot of songs even by the fifth take it felt to me like both me and you in some songs burned out yeah like it's like the song is already kind of silly yeah it still has good stuff in it but a lot of it is what what i find after the first couple of solos is that I'll start uh, like if it, if I'm kind of going really over three takes but like five takes for sure uh, I start playing less interesting uh, motifs I start just playing more lines like ta -da 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 -da, yeah. with less rhythm and then about the ninth take I catch myself and then I'm like okay so I already played all the lines now I'm gonna really make just statements and then I play something that's so square and stupid but you can't use it yeah. I can't use it like do di bu bi ba ba da fi ba ba it's just like another, so another simple. big difference in how we record is you know that we're all playing together because we want to get oh. this interaction this we well, barely did well, it for jazz it's very common we, yeah but I'm no it's not common in the sense that we're not intending to take like a full take and use just like the take as yeah as but I'm saying for the album it. just when when a lot of you know indie bands or rock bands are in the studio uh it's typically one person is playing at a time to get their parts down so it's, it's so very weird. intense why go together just like to be in the booth and give advice. Yeah, and to nitpick each other. It's <laughs> well, cause I would assume that when you make an, a rock album, you would take like, you do basic tracks. So like everybody would play the song together and then you would just use the bass and drums. And that's not why, if you, yeah, why would you do bass and drums at the same time? When you do rock. Like if you already vote together, why would you just do everything together? Maybe they just don't have a thing. Maybe there's no value to playing together. Maybe it's there not is, but you don't have well, to do it's, it. So takes longer He's, for a yeah, rock yeah. and for a rock and roll thing i think you're right but for a prog thing it's nicer to once the drums are done completely done to then really analyze what happened in the session give the drummer the freedom to improvise and, and transition how he sees fit and then to go in and play your part on top of it i actually like to do bass after the guitar or even after vocals sometimes that's what the beatles did 
Yeah. So you always did bass last. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah, because the the bass works as it's like the glue between the harmony and the rhythm. Yeah. Uh, it just sounds to me like a waste of time to not do it together. Yeah. No, it is. I mean, I cannot. We we they did used to take two months. And yeah, we track some 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 yeah, people take when, six when months. When you have a lot of money, year. it makes sense. But uh, but, that, but you're not uh, really making. Nobody has a lot of money now. But you're not making. You know. And also, you're not really making an album at that whole time. You call it recording an album, but you are writing the music. And hanging in the out studio <laughs> and hanging out. Yeah, when well, you yeah. have the money. And, uh, That's what I'm saying. So. It just looks to me like a waste of time to do it separately. If you so already all of this to say that our studio experience was like in the room, set up, and tracking at 8 a.m. And then we went till 7 p.m. the first day. Yeah. And then back in the booth at it's 8 a.m. the next day. It's basically what jazz bands do, though. Yeah. You heard about Ben Homo yeah. said. It's basically what jazz bands yeah. do. Uh-huh. And, uh, it's not unique in that sense. Yeah. yeah. We had yeah. uh, we had Greg Cock come and watch us track uh, our song Midnight Squirrel. He was there for his song. I watched a lot of his videos over the years. Had no idea how tall that motherfucker was. Yeah, he's, a big boy. he's gigantic, man. He's so fucking tall. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like I feel like we impressed the cock. Why? He was a very nice man. Yeah, very Why nice. do you feel that? I don't know. I feel like I feel like we Did played really well. I didn't. I feel that. I'm not saying I know that. But I just, uh, I was listening to the take that he listened to uh, after. Oh, listened to it after? Yeah, and I was just like, this is some great guitar playing, man. Jesus Christ. I didn't think that was the best take we did, actually. It wasn't the best. It was, one of the, it was the third one. Yeah. Well, by the third take, you, I usually do my favorite stuff the first and second take. And then by the third take, I'm trying to just... Yeah. Like, what have I not done yet to give you options when you're editing and putting it together? So, yeah, there's definitely some parts of that third, fourth, fifth take that you go for something, you take a risk, and maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, for me, like, editing nowadays, like especially like when we already sound good together, there's much less of me trying to make the moments happen and more it's much more just looking for the takes that felt good and splicing them together yeah but i i mean i really am not i'm no longer into this idea of getting a great bass track on top of a, bass on top of a great drum track on top of a great guitar track and calling that music as if like great drumming a great sequence of events that's loosely based on whatever it did uh, you used to do it a lot. I remember you, my experience listening back to the our old albums was like it was like you had taken a bunch of pictures of my face and ripped them up and then assembled them in a mosaic yeah. of my face. So it's, it 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 sounded like me, yeah. but I never Which played that. Think? Goatman, yeah, it was very much like that. Yeah, well, the, you were just so ugly back then. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's it's just it's just uh, you know, especially with Blake uh, when he was in the band, oh. I just had to, I like some like things in the drums would change in ways that just did not make sense. So that's why we called it. Different this wasn't the this wasn't the yeah the the real reason was because you guys wanted to record your solos after after you had made. Yeah. A cleaned up rhythm track. That's right. why we used to do it that way. Right. That was that. But, but but now we can all play well together, so it makes more sense to just find a no, great solo have, and use the have, take that's under that's it. That wasn't the reason. The reason was that we didn't with Eric Eric's studio. It just he didn't have enough good rooms. That's right. That was the reason. Yeah, that's the main reason because the saxophone booth where we were recording it was too small and closed sounding. That we we wanted oh. to record saxophone in the live room after everybody was done. But the the problem with that also. Like, if you just had the track over a backing track of us playing the way we play, it would have been locked in enough for you to solo well. But in 2016, it wouldn't have been. You You know, know, I had a funny experience this time, because I I gave you a couple extra takes of the bass solo after you guys, Mm -hmm. we finished tracking, you guys were taking a walk, I, I did a few, and playing over a recorded rhythm take 
is so much different than having people in the room accompanying your solo. Yeah. Especially the way we play. I mean, I would yeah, say... Yeah, because I had you guys reacting to the things that I had right. done in previous takes. Right, right, right. Especially but then I wasn't trying to do those in this take, but the, the reaction was still happening in the track, and it would throw that, me off every time. That's exactly, exactly. Especially, like, if you... When you're playing with a guy like Everett, like, if you're going to play something very against more than once, you have to be prepared to get that shot back at you, yeah. right? So if you're if the groove is like, and you're going like, yeah, everything is going to just be that because he's going to think you want him to kind of, you know, surf that wave. Um, and yeah, but, and, and when you're when you're overdubbing, you don't want any of that. You want the drums and bass to be as neutral as possible. And I think in Goatman, other than moments of drama, uh, which are very specific, you know, the most of the idea behind uh, editing it the way we did was to create these, you know, kind of rhythm tracks that were just neutral, neutral and out of the way. You know, yeah. we could just do whatever we wanted. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, no, we chose, when we chose the drums for Goatman, yeah. we really chose the interesting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially like, you know, in fills and like peaks of the solo. And the way you would build, you would build it differently. Yeah, so. the, ki- the kinds of... The, to me, most of the drama in our solos is the interaction. Like the moment, it, it's not enough for you to play a great yeah, line. Yeah, but it's like it's interaction anyway. It's uh, it's it's complicated. Well, that's the whole point of of being in a band is working with musicians that can make you sound even better than you are. Yeah. I think we're all great players, but when you're when you have the right backup under you, that's when your talents really. Uh, I agree. Shine. It's not the same, and to me, it's not as fun. I'm not into playing with backing tracks. So I'd rather just record. It's much easier. Well, this is why I, I never like to see solo musicians and guys that loop all the instruments themselves. I like seeing a band that knows each other's playing, that supports each other, because I, I, I think that three or four musicians can make each other sound better yeah. than anyone can make themselves sound. I'm just saying the way we play, mm-hmm. you and me. It's like with all the subdivisions, if you put a drummer that plays well and we play on it, you will hear a lot of interacting parts. Right. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't yeah. sound like we don't play with the drums just because the way we think about subdivision. So it's like, it still sounds... Relative like, to the drums, no, yeah, no matter it sounds what like, you do. It's a different kind of relationship. Yeah, it's not the same like if I take Pat Metheny's album, but the percussion is really on top of the loops. Mm-hmm. And he's just playing... And that stuff to the time, yeah. Because the percussion is just looped, and it really feel like a backing track. Do you know what I mean? The loops, <laughs> loops certainly do that, but there's also a certain kind of way that you play when you're overdubbing and punching. Yeah, but it's all the same. Absolutely different. Yeah, okay. Than the way you would play with people. With people, yeah. yeah okay. It's just the difference between kind of, uh, you know, being the horse or the cart. You know, it's like it's re- it really feels. Uh, when people are listening to you, well, you you talk differently to a chatbot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's like when you, for me, I really feel it like um, just with overdubbing, you you can sometimes have the sensation while you're tracking, like, is this working? Like, this is not working. What I'm doing is not working. And when you're playing, it's like I have a very different kind of doubt. I'm like this, yeah. like maybe this, you know, and I, I don't think about, it's not like you're trying to throw your playing you know, into it's a, a thing. It's yeah. a, another big difference is, let's say you're you're overdubbing and you get like four or five measures into your solo and you hit a clam, you know, like, okay, scrap this take. Right. Yeah, you usually don't do that when you clam people. But, yeah. if you're, but for the same reason, like, you don't hit that clam either because... The stakes no, are higher. Hit. You don't want to stop. Well, no, of course, you, every once in a while, sure. But um, you, the, you the ability going. to stop, right, and, and 
but being in the mindset of, of knowing that you can stop versus being yeah. in the mindset also, where like you don't want to bum you don't want to bum everybody out if the drummer thinks he's having a great take and you've hit like a C sharp instead of a C it's not a good reason to like restart but if you're yeah. alone it's uh, you know yeah. you don't yeah. have that pressure yeah that's that's a big thing I would say the one thing I was it, it's so nice that everybody can play with a click so well. Like that's oh, so yeah. like that was a non issue. And we we did It wasn't an issue on the last album either. I no, remember it, wasn't. It, it remember it felt great. No, but I think the thing that we do that's very wise is uh kind of decide on tempos together and st- like not yeah. not not planning what the tempo would be and just, you know, being like Play Everett, it. what's the tempo? And then he like comes up with like I think it's two thirty and then we start playing. Well but like, you see that sometimes different different like I would know sometimes what tempo is wrong or you would know according to what subdivisions we're playing or sort of mm-hmm. part of a group well I'm, but I'm, I think that's really a uh, a decision that's best made while tracking because the way you feel like you know it's so subtle what's what like it's also it's almost like today it feels this way yeah. like how like some th- some days you can like make your 16th notes really stick well I like this, I like having it more like the show than you do I feel like more like the show yeah I like it just the way we play it to do it and you sometimes kind of like to change it like in mid notes goal that we did it slower when we usually well, do it I, it is different it's a we're, it's a different environment yeah um you want it to feel good while you're recording and we're in a different environment you can watch you guys will say it I'm just saying with me specifically I usually like to keep it on the same and we did keep it on the same it's around the same it's the ballpark Uh, Midnight Squirrel is the only one I would say that's like noticeably slower and uh, it's not very much slow it's just I I just noticed that it's slow because the way it's like stop let's sit and the way not for 30 seconds but uh, some division above it I would guess for most bands like just playing with a click would cause them to stop a lot like if they're used to playing live yeah. and they're doing that it's like you know but we were getting full takes and things were fine <laughs> I felt bad a little bit for like it seemed to me like the crew here is not work, is not used to like working this many takes like they, this many notes this much music I, I feel like they're used to like doing a take and then having like 25 minutes of see, check it well, out and they're probably doing a lot of multi-track stuff in this studio too where they're doing a pop song or a rock song and they've got they're just doing the drums and right. they're laying it all down so for them to be sitting in the booth listening to all of us go for it for two full days yeah was really take a lot for take after take after take yeah, I, the one thing about I mean, fucking what? studios that I that I could never see myself doing this work uh, is like the thing where you just mic a snare drum and then I don't know put the microphone in an aquarium and listen to it and yeah like you know just experiment with like getting the sounds themselves. It's like to me, if like once you play me like three guitar sounds, I'm like done. Yeah, it's like I like this one the best. Can we play now? Yeah. Like it's so exhausting to like compare things that you have no memory for. You know, it's not like because yeah. if you sing me triplets and sixteenth notes, I have perfect memory for what that is yeah. or like different melodies. I can remember that, but the, w- the sound color. Uh, I'm really bad at that, especially when it comes to drums. Everett's always asking me, "What do you think of? What do you think of these symbols?" Like, I'm very opinionated about that actually. Well. Yeah, I don't know. I have trouble recalling sounds in my mind like that. Like put two next to each other and I, and I'll know. Yeah. Like when I hear it and it's good, I like it, but I don't have like a a bank in my mind of all these well, different sounds. I know sounds. what works live. It's hard yeah. to know what works on the. Like I can tell when symbols don't work live because yeah. I don't remember what that's like. The one thing that I was kind of, you know, uh, hesitant about is yeah. Everett's bass drum sound. I uh, liked it. I, I like it too, but like the fact that it has like a front skin with no hole for the microphone to where you don't get any of that slap. I can, it's more like a jazz thing where you have a note is, is something that I uh, actually liked the sound we were getting on record I think more than I like it live what do you mean? on, on strong thing? no this, this, this drum how I'm used to hearing it at shows versus the sound we were getting in the studio yesterday I think, I think we really captured the right aspects yeah. of it well he borrowed a few cymbals and that, I think that helped like I insisted that he get it's like a dark 
on a dark ride because his rides are in Shredding at Sweetwater. They're like kind of thin rides, and he plays them hard, so they sound like crashes most of the time. Uh, so the one thing in the overhead is that we never seem to get a lot of note. And, uh, well, we didn't know, but we always looked for... Uh, yeah, we always stick. Thing. We stick, always we yeah. always told people stick when we went note. Yeah. Uh, so that's just kind of in the EQ band of how you get the overhead sound. But, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I was really trying to listen to the snare drum sound. and Snare drum snare sound sounded great. Yeah. And like from the get-go. Uh-huh. I was really happy with what he did. Yeah. Uh, I, I did like, I liked the kick. I thought the kick was good. I thought it was physical, but not too too annoying. Mm-hmm. Know? I'm excited about just, you know, really committing to recording some rhythm guitar tracks. Like, I think that was uh, some songs especially. And the acoustic yeah. guitar you put down was awesome. Yeah? It really added a lot, a lot of color and atmosphere. So nice to record in a studio like this, where it's like, can I have, do you guys have an acoustic? And they're like, oh yeah, here's like this double old Martin. And I was like, that's a $8,000 guitar. It's great. Yeah, they have everything. Yeah, they have everything. So the guy asked me to, and I was, like, oh, if you need any of the saxophones. Yeah, for the so, session. Yeah. It's so crazy. I'm actually surprised we didn't use more toys. We didn't really have enough time to no. explore. What would we use? I Is mean, that, well, if, if there was something we wanted to use, we would own it already. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I had a lot of time, I would use Barry saxophones. This is definitely... Yeah. Uh, and altos, this know? is definitely gear privilege. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Feel, I don't think we took full advantage of it. No, but no, you can't, you can't even... There's no time. You'd need a week. Yeah, yeah. there's so much again, here. Because there's so much saxophones. I would, I would definitely but like you said, better. Everett did go through. Everett, Everett picked some cymbals, and that definitely helped. Uh, yeah, we insisted on him playing percussion, too. And, and yeah. really, he wanted his kit, you know. Yeah. So I can see that if you think of, you can get different kit for every song, you know, if you want to. Here. Right. I'm sure it will work out, but you yeah. will play what he's used to, which makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Snow is great from the Philadelphia Drum Company, so... Yeah. No, the, uh, again, it's... The percussion was nice to have a few options. Because mm-hmm. usually you don't really have options. It's like we have that shaker, that thing. But Actually, I thought um, there was a couple percussion things I would have liked to add that weren't there. But those are like really specific. What, like a gourd? Yeah, shaker A would have been cool on that the song. Shaker A is that big one with the net? Yeah, with the neck and the beads. Yeah. yeah you gotta also know how didn't to have, play uh, that. Yeah, but I think he does. He's, he's really studied all this music. Everett? No, he doesn't. He started WWF in weed. He did not study how to play shaker. He does Taking a course in college, it's not studying something. I mean, when... He said that himself. Not to discredit the professional shaker rate players out there, but if you know if you know how to shake the thing, he could he could have made a loop. Yeah, there's a lot to that, to that. It's it's actually, you know, it's like all these instruments. We we've had a few. We've worked with percussionists a few times. And they do something else, you know. It's kind of oh yeah, that's it's, true. Like, it's kind of like playing in it. Like, I know it seems like uh, when you make a little loop that you could just do it yourself, but it's the, pe- no, you're right. the people the that do it can really do it. I've yeah. seen people like Brazilian again, even guys, you the st- do things I'd never dream of. You have to still fix a lot of it to make a nice loop, but even the stuff you fix, like there's as long as it's like it's not just. It's you can't turn people into MIDI. It's like you said, there's also there's a face to it, even if it's percussion. So yeah. It's like you, if you if you don't have it, it doesn't. Also, work. So, I mean. So you're yeah, you're creating a sequence of sounds. But maybe this is the sounds. right thing for us because sometimes with some of with certain Latin music, there's like a different swing to it. There's a different dispersion of eighth notes and sixteenth notes. Right. Right. So. They're, they're, yeah. Especially the Brazilian stuff that has you know a certain swing to it. And uh, maybe for our record, since you guys are soloing over it, it makes sense to have someone with the same kind of rhythmic concept and distribution of subdivisions. Yeah, certainly you don't want something it. like super traditional. That would just not yeah. work. Even though every time not you have a horn person, a horn, a horn player play on traditional stuff, it's Cuban music or Brazilian music, they all play the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? The horn players just play the same. Like the way that a jazz guy would. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. Uh, those Brazilian sixteenth notes. That's the one thing that's like really. I can't even do it. But like, you know. Yeah, the samba thing is not the same as. It's yeah, not, but it's when not you play it up the same way. It, uh-huh. It's just it's yeah. just trumpet. Yeah, you just rock it the way you rock it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's not obvious, right? But it, it but it it is. 
the way we do it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Cool. The tools, the same tools. Yeah. How, how do you feel like you have enough enough stuff for the album? I don't know. How do you I always did. You know, that's how I feel like. I always did. I don't see how this would be different. I was more relaxed than usual. I yeah. had a good time. Didn't cut my tongue because of uh, headphones, which was a huge thing for me. I always cut my tongue yeah. after a little bit. So what's the deal with the headphones? They're just open? They're just open, yeah, so I can hear myself a little bit acoustically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a problem. My ears were ringing like a motherfucker yesterday because I had to blast drums. It's it's weird, you know, usually the drums are like right there. I'm in the room with them, but I just couldn't use what I was hearing from the drums themselves with those kind of headphones. So I had to like find a mix where I... You, you might have liked having headphones like I did. But Maybe. Too. We do things but, so differently. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think the thing for me is that like what you used to listen. You have earplugs and shows. You used to right. listen to stuff way. Different I'm used to performing do. at a lower volume. Sure, pers- at least from my perspective. And hearing yeah, way less yeah. of what's yeah. going on, like frequencies. Well, right. especially distorted guitar. Like you have, you have a lot of graininess that kind of gets swallowed in the drums. And when I just hear acoustic drums with just the guitar right in my head, like I have to somehow bury it in the, in a mix. Oh, you saw when I played, you told me to, so to take the headphones off when I played the solo saxophone part. Oh, you played much better. But it was like, yeah, it's very difficult when you yeah, hear every it's little in your screen, brain. but it's way too much. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, see, my problem is I'm used to having a, you know, four 10-inch speakers, and the little one centimeter wide speaker that's in those headphones doesn't carry those low frequencies in the same sure. way. So my limiting factor was that I could only get the bass in my headphones so loud because I wasn't using a cab, right? We're going, we're going direct. Um, so I had to set the bass at the level where I could hear it pretty well against the drums acoustically next to me without the bass breaking up or maybe only breaking up a little bit at the very bottom. Yeah, it's weird. I wonder, it's what, that. I wonder what most bassists do to monitor because I, I see how it's a challenge where you have such a physical sound you know, and you're just hearing hearing it like, you know, right inside your ear. And I'm sure there's like ways to Well it can be not to not to generalize. You feel but, uh, for them. A lot of Yeah, sure. But but you see bass players all the time in a studio going direct and, and playing with Well, you can go direct and be in the room with your amp still. Sure, but I think a lot of people record direct without an amp in these situations. Huh. Um but for many styles of music, you don't need to hear every little articulation, mm-hmm. you know. Well, do you really lose articulation in the headphones? Is that what so much. The bass? You, you lose, no, you lose, I guess that, like the, the physicality of the ghost notes mm. is something that really goes away. So, And that's like your connection to the groove. I see. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, it's tough, but process. I think we got it. I think we we made you, the adjustments. For you we to, to to be able to record with, with your amp, you would have to have something to take the, basically the volume down. You would have to have some sort of volume pedal or volume knob, right? What do you need to do? Because you would need to put your preamp too loud for what you like it. So if you have like a volume pedal between that and the power amp, or between that and the cab, whatever. Like I'm trying to figure out. And you can take it down and still have your sound, basically, because your problem was that it was too loud, right? Yeah, unless we just had a, two different preamps. Hmm. We could split the signal with two different preamps. No, I'm saying but volume pedal won't do it. Not sure. I don't understand. I mean, again, with with ca- with uh, bass amps and re- recording like your bass cab with a microphone, you know, there needs to be a reason. Like that, you need to be. No, able no, I'm not saying for recording. I'm saying for him to use it to monitor. And have it, yeah. I mean, if he just wants to monitor like that, he could just be in a room with it. No, but he can't. That's what he was saying because he doesn't like the sound that he gets when he needs to crank his preamp. Sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure the workaround for that. But I think the best thing is to just find a way to get a great monitor mix. The, like, the only way to do it is a is an additional offboard preamp. No, I think I think the way the way to just solve the problem, which you know could have been done if if you knew what to look for, was just to have Sean EQ the send that he's sending you, 
and then you can just monitor it and hear what you're looking to hear but you got to be very specific about what you're looking it's to so hear. It's so funny. All I can say is that in the headphones it it, it sounds like a DI. It has that yeah. plasticky yeah. sound to it, but then in the in the booth it doesn't. So what we did on the last album um and I didn't like this, which is why we didn't do it this time. You're but I actually in sat in the booth. Yeah. Um thinking that I would just use the the booth's main monitors as my way to hear the sound. But the problem is the mix that I wanted to track with is not the mix that the engineer wanted yeah, to listen right. to during the session. Pay attention to yeah, things. So. Right, right, exactly. Not a super bass heavy mix and that's what I need. So I ended up wearing headphones in the in the control room. Yeah. And I would have I had the bass cranked in the headphones. Yeah. And I would wear like one can. So then I heard the rest of the band in the the house monitors yeah, and I had enough of that's space. such a that's such a half solution yeah it wasn't like, it know. wasn't ideal but I was able to hear everything yeah no it's tough I mean it's 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 far from perfect and it's like it's weird I don't know for me at this point we've made so many albums that I can get to this place uh within like an hour just you know messing with my monitor mix where it's far from ideal it's way too loud all the time I mean, but I'm like I can at least play yeah you know i can you know, the I perfect can do the this. perfect situation would it would be that we're all completely sonically isolated but we can all see each other and and the, i wouldn't want to be in a, in a room with my cabs no no because they want to put it too loud yeah mm. it's like i want to i want to be able to crank not i guess a hundred watt amp i actually i don't really go over four so, uh but it's i'd love really to, i would love to be in a room with my cab yeah, right next to it. Kind of it's thing. funny. There's no more facility. Uh, like this Studio A at Sweetwater, it's basically just an amp room, uh, a small like a small live room and a big live room, and then there's like a closet where you can put a bass cab that's not treated. Uh, yeah. But and if you throw you're baffles there, around it, if you're there though, you can't see us. And our music, you can't really play our music if we don't have eye contact because we have a lot. Well, the of nice thing about cues. recording a bass cab is that you don't really need. <laughs> Um, natural room reverb for it. You tend to want it pretty dry, so you can totally just throw baffles around the microphone and throw a blanket over the top of the whole thing. Yeah, but if you get too close and impersonal with a cab, then at that point, what's the difference between that and a DI? Like if you're getting yeah. no spaciousness out of the sound. I right. mean, again, that's why we if, use the DI. If you again, uh, if you're a Jocko and you're running a gigantic yeah. SVT tube preamp with a pa- tube power amp into a like A12. And it's moving all that air, and there's so much character in, in what's coming out of the cab. Realistically, you're probably not going to recreate that using plugins or even onboard gear, you know, later on. You'll do something, but it won't have that. So if you've spent your, like, resources, time, and energy figuring out how to get exactly your vision of what bass sounds like to pop out of... Uh, out of your cab, then you you might as well just throw a mic and capture it. But if you're just going for like a bass tone that's solid and good and supportive, you know, there's no there's no real reason most of the time. Without like Jacko had all these like chorus effects and like stuff like that just oozing from his gear. It's weird we were talking about this in the context of bass and how like in the seventies when you were listening to bands like doesn't matter if it's like Paul McCartney's band or Billy Joel's band or the like you know Pink Floyd it's like the bass sound like the way the way the timbre of the bass was was a very essential part of what these bands were like they had like their bassists were really in charge of a color vision for the lines not just the lines themselves and it's like as you move towards the 2000s people stopped looking for like unique amp identities like mark bass and stuff like that it was more about just being light and yeah. useful and really getting a di a consistent sound and people really started focusing in terms of like carving out frequency about the low frequencies that sound pretty much identical uh, rather than the high overtone structure where you know you really start getting the difference between different rigs of bass mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean now I think ninety five percent of what people do with bass is post. If you want a unique sound, just it's like a cool plug in, and that's how they get it. But they don't uh, they don't expect it to come out in a room sounding the way it sounds. Hmm. 
It's a very different way of doing it. Do you have examples of people today? I'm trying to think about bass players today. I mean, again, if, if Sean in the studio said like a month ago we recorded Victor Wooten here, and he had his heart key rig, and he mic'd it and put like a little bit of it in the mix for Victor. But they said it's like this was basically the eye. And that's Victor Wooten, you know. Yeah, it's too. Also, uh, again, you do I don't know because Victor Wooten, what he doesn't know, his own album. I'm sure he didn't care about whatever we did here. Yeah. Just because I know his generation. His generation recorded so much. It's just... For him, it's like when you play a live show, you don't think about a specific live show. No. You just play. So mm -hmm. I think for a lot of these people, they recorded so much, they don't care about the recording. I feel like they're also like... Also, now they get invited to things like Sweetwater Studio so often, they don't think about like a big opportunity or something. They like really make an amazing thing. They're like, I've already done records. I'm just, just showing up. Doing what they need me to do, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just punt, clocking in. Yeah, it's not the same with our albums. No. But, uh, yeah, I had a thought when we were here about like how little of even the stuff they do in serious studios like this studio and other studios we know go gets to anybody it's just mostly bands that like just don't have the way of getting their music to people like most uh, you were telling us about billy eilish winning like a grammy for production or something they made in their bathroom one Grammy for the best produced album. So, I mean, that's such a message sent to everyone who has a recording <laughs> studio ever in their bathroom. In the bathroom. I mean, we know <laughs> a few. That's to me not a message. The message is, if you sell, we'll give you a Grammy. That's the only message the Grammys have. Yeah. If you sell, you're going to get a Grammy. We don't care about anything else. This is not a bunch of uh, experts, whatever that means. But what percentage of albums that are actually like successful now on Spotify on whatever wherever people listen to music uh, are made in a closet at home? A lot, and but a lot of the stuff you have in closet at home are, are pretty good compared to the listen to uh, what we did at home yeah. with pretty cheap equipment. Yeah, yeah we made Fern, like we made sounds, a whole Fernway album at home. Yeah, it sounds pretty good compared to other ones that are in way more expensive studios. Yeah. I'm not saying there's no difference, there's there a, difference, is a difference. But you can definitely do a lot now at home. And yeah. if you have some money well, and you're willing to invest in it, you can get a, if you get a two thousand dollar mic, it's not an album for somebody to have at home. Yeah. So well, I mean there used to be a recording industry that was focused on the quality of recording. It's it's crazy. But the biggest think. difference is with people and what they knew how to do and now nobody knows how to do it anyway. Yeah. So you record saxophone. Didn't we tell us that we didn't record saxophone? We may record saxophone once. Yeah. Before we met us. Yeah. Yeah, that's nuts. And we worked with everybody. So yeah, it's totally that's crazy. a big difference. The, the, the gear is actually better. It's not that it's better than better, but even the low end gear is pretty good compared, compared to what it used to be. Yeah. So, you know, if you just had people that knew how to work stuff, then yeah. It's yeah. much better. But I don't know. Being in, being in a situation where we, like our songs are worked out and like you know we know what we want, maybe not like in the resolution of every note of every solo. That's gonna take some time to put together. But even but that, if you just if we had just told you how hey, we're doing one song a day and we're just gonna do like seven takes or something instead, and we're just doing once a day, I think it would be better than what we did. Do you? Yeah. Why? Because I think your brain is fried by the time you're done. Oh yeah every day my the last song we did on first day is the easiest song for me to play usually mm -hmm. it was the hardest song for me to play you yeah. know like in the entire recording process and even though it's the one that's the most in my wheelhouse yeah just because my brain was fired and everybody's brains were fired yeah. too so that makes if, if ever it is tired it makes we, me you know and we didn't choose my brain harder. we didn't choose an order for tracking that was set to that we just did them all well, in the order of our what show other would be set to I don't it? know we didn't we didn't think about it but what was I so thought about it was so there's no difference it's just yeah. you'd it's be all, tired it's all it, yeah, I you, thought it was a good idea to do headless chicken first thing in the morning second day like that's, that's the only thing that like, I thought we should be fresh for because we, we basically never played that yeah. uh, and that's when we I did knew. the ballad right before that it's funny because like the way the set is broken up is to give people 
a rest over the course of that 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. But then we were breaking up this set over the course of 48 hours. Right. And those rests still came when we yeah. needed them. I, I thought that was kind of amusing. But the depot, to me, just the depot should have been last. That's the only thing I thought about. Yeah. I it's thought about doing it first in the beginning just because I didn't... I, I thought it was like a soundtrack? Yeah, we're going to use that yeah, as yeah. a soundtrack, but since we started a day before. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I don't think it would have mattered. I think it well, would. the reality is we all need to play every song at the peak of our ability, so every song is the hardest song. Yeah, yeah but there's it no easy. There's no easy songs. Yeah, you're trying to give it your all. Yeah. But, it, but it doesn't... Yeah. If, if I'm, if if I'm giving it my all on a, on a fast song or if I'm giving it my all on a slow song, it, it, mentally it's it, it's no different for me. Yeah. If it took one, one song a day or two songs a day, I think it would have been better, generally mm-hmm. speaking, but it's so much more expensive. I feel, like, yeah. I feel like if we took one song a day, we'd after a few hours, we'd just go away and have nothing else to work I, on. I, th- I think we could split the difference here. I, I don't think, think three I don't songs think we a day. Could, I don't think we could have done one song a day. I think it would be too much time. Well, yeah. What do you mean? To be in here for a week? Yeah, to like to, like to do Freeman Massacre for like eight hours. I think after like two hours. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, that's good what I'm saying. Just do a two-hour thing. Oh, and then go home, yeah. rest? Yeah. I yeah. could do four to, four to six hours in a day, but we were doing eight yeah. to ten. Yeah. Four songs in a day is way too much. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you guess see, it's just... in the last song, your brain is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you'll you'll see it in the editing because those songs are gonna be a little, more, a little more sloppy. Yeah. But again, you yeah. don't know. Uh, yeah, the truth is, don't know, but uh, you don't know where the good takes are. Fi- uh, right. We always we know. did it's, fisticuff it's last time, and I was yeah. my band was already fired when we did fisticuff. Came out fine. And yeah, considering the takes were generally were less to use well, mm-hmm. but the solo the way it came out. It, it, we almost it, used it, it, it came out, its entirety, yeah. Yeah, but it just came out. It came out better to me than some solos that had more stuff. Right. Just because, yeah. just because that's how it came out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, there's yeah, not it's such a direct great. link between like how exhausted you feel and how great you play. It would be a more pleasurable Sometimes. experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think on average it would make it better, mm-hmm. but it's way too way too expensive. Yeah, we have yeah. to get a few more days of. You know, paying everybody a few more days of that. I'm Airbnb. Steaks every night. Yeah. Yeah. That that's not a necessity. Bear necessity, but it was nice. It's a necessity to bears. (laughs) That's right. All right, we should probably get going. We need more coffee. I feel like. Do you agree? Yeah. All right. Was it guys? Forty minutes? Uh, Who knows? Uh, Well, so this was uh, music real talk with Marvin. Subscribe. Next episode Uh, is unique. Yeah, next episode is going to be our 50th episode. Which is a unique number. And uh, check us out at facebook.com slash marvinmusic, marvinmusic.bandcamp.com, and see you next time. If I didn't charge it.